Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the best Western premiere that doesn't quite have a sign out yet. But thanks to Alyssa Jones, you all got an email to know where to come and what sign would be on, so you made it here fine. And as we've learned over the years, have food, you will find it. So I want to welcome everyone here this evening for our spring MSREI meeting. Uh, over the years, it's just been a delight to have see everyone be able to get together, catch up on things, because it seems like Tuesday from one week goes to Tuesday and to the next, and everything flies so fast. Like having some moments to take a breath, have a nice meal together, share some ideas, uh, hopefully new ideas, and also share in each other's success for how we take care of everyone in our community, as a community, to do so. And it's a great privilege that uh, you give me to be able, and Alyssa Jones, to be able to provide this kind of a, men, uh, a venue. I always want to bring someone and invite someone, and if we're fortunate enough to bring and invite someone who is a thought leader in our field and causes us to challenge our settled ideas. And although we're confident in what we do for our patients, we also know this is one of the fastest moving fields in medicine. It's always changing. It makes it very difficult for big health systems to stay up, and we all know that we've been part of in the past or in the current, current time, and even when we're not in a big health system to stay abreast of issues. And a lot of times we focused on technology or practice to the patient. But I recall back in about 2011, we invited some legal minds to speak to us about surrogacy, gestational carrier, and of course, once there's a problem situation that occurs, then all of a sudden it draws everyone's attention after the fact. But the purpose of that meeting, as it is this evening, is to be proactive, to be thinking about these things. How can we service our patients and our community wisely and well, and make sure the standard of care of our practice is up to the task? Now, it happens to be this evening, we have an amazing guest, Susan Crockett, who's going to speak to us. And I can say that many of you have known her through American Society for Reproductive Medicine, and she's been on various committees. She's currently working on consent forms to come out from SART, but she's been so proactive in so many ways. And for so many of us, that's come through the grassroots of our own personal experience with fertility or the challenges to become fertile in parents. And so too, for many of us, as it is for our guests, that's her roots and her why that motivated her to come into this field. And although there are a litany of different um, credits and accomplishments that Susan has made over the years, she has pleaded and begged with me to stick to only two pages to talk about. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but really, to, she will present to you ideas and thoughts today that we need to think about, not only for today, but for tomorrow. So it's with uh, great privilege and pleasure that I introduce you to our guest speaker tonight, Susan Crockett. What I actually said was if he said more than about two sentences, I was going to make him give the talk. Can everybody hear me? This mic seems a little funny. Yeah? It's okay? All right. Usually people don't have trouble hearing lawyers or they don't want to hear us anyway, but if you do, just raise your hand. So one, thank you for inviting me, and it's a really lovely to be here, and when Michael explained the way he puts these meetings together, I was more than honored to be able to join you all. And it's wonderful to see the collaborative spirit that brings people together to learn something, even if it is from a lawyer once in a while. So I was planning on coming here, and then Alyssa surprised me and said, I've named your talk, When Does Life Begin? It's like, whoa, okay, this is going to be very interesting, because in many ways I feel like a square peg, and I cannot answer that question. Lawyers, I mean, I'm here amongst a group of doctors, med med medical professionals, embryologists, and a lawyer is not going to be able to give you that answer. The best that I can hope to do is give you a legal lens through which to look at some of these tough questions. And so if I were the one titling this talk, I'd probably use the book that Dr. Howard Jones and I published in 2010, Legal Conceptions. And then I would like to talk tonight a little bit about understanding the role of the law in embryo use, dispute, storage, and disposition, because I think all of those are issues in which the law has pretty persuasively insinuated itself into your practices and your laboratories. Uh, Michael also suggested I leave lots of time for questions, which I'm happy to do as long as you don't expect answers. 
So the roadmap that I sketched out for us tonight is the following. What is an embryo from a legal perspective? And I'd like to give you a little bit of a flyover, if you will, an update on what I consider divorcing embryos, traveling embryos, and abandoned embryos. And then I'd like to take a quick look at egg freezing because I think it's rapidly transforming what a lot of us do and how we think about it. And then because lawyers are always um, accused of talking only about doom and gloom, I'd like to look a little bit at personhood bills and political footballs and where we may be headed in the future. So in the old days, we all knew where babies came from, right? The stork brought one baby to one really happy mom and dad in their little house, and everybody was happily, lived happily ever after. Once the lawyers got involved, we knew that the answer was to go straight to the courthouse door. No matter how many houses there were, we know that the law has to be involved in family building, and you guys make it even more interesting. So what I wanted to do to put this in context is I believe that there are three things about the ARTs that are very unique when the law looks at what you do. And we're going to focus mostly on cryopreservation tonight. But the three elements that I often teach my students is fertilization is taking place outside the womb. We are cryopreserving everything you can think of at the moment. And then we have third parties, and I don't mean insurance companies, because sometimes people get confused who aren't in this field. And those raise a lot of unique issues. And tonight's topic, they raise issues around disposition, I think. So let's start with why the law is playing catch up with what you all are doing. So I want to take you in about two minutes if, or less through the, a legal history of IVF embryos. And the reason it's important is because the courts, the legislatures, and the lawmakers are all trying to figure out how to deal with this stuff. And before 1978, as you well knew, there was no IVF, so we had no ex utero embryos. In 1973, Roe v. Wade came down from the Supreme Court of the United States with two very seminal principles. There's a constitutional right to privacy, and a person does not include the unborn. The Supreme Court then started having a series of cases in which those laws were, those principles were refined, in some ways limited, but we have now laws that, you know, you're entitled to contraception, you can, you're not allowed to be involuntarily sterilized, women still have a right to abortion, and fetal tampering laws started creeping in. Why? Because after Roe v. Wade, so many state legislatures were concerned that this was going to run amok, that a slew of fetal tampering statutes were passed across the country. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember Dr. Ken Edelin, who was a chief resident at Boston Medical Center in the 70s, and he had a nurse who he was doing a second trimester abortion, and she decided he had held the fetus in the birth canal in order to cause its premature demise and called the district attorney's office, and he was actually convicted of manslaughter. That conviction was overturned, but that's how heated the legal world got in response to Roe v. Wade. So we have some history with what's going on today in many ways. In the 1980s, along comes IVF cryopreservation. Now we have ex utero embryos everywhere, and we can have disputes over them because these things are now something that are going to laugh and able to fight about. This has forced the courts to start rethinking this whole question about reproductive law, autonomy, reproductive rights, the sanctity of a woman's body. I would suggest to you that issues around donation, PGD, PGS, embryonic stem cell research are all contributing to this question of when life begins. Conception, I think, is becoming a political football of a term. We'll discuss it a little bit later. And there has been, as you well know, a deluge of activity in the legislatures over the last few years around personhood and other limitations. So what's so different about freezing anyway? I would suggest to you a couple of things from a lawyer's perspective. When you freeze, you have suddenly created an inherently uncertain time gap. I am aware of, you know, baby born 12 years after an embryo was frozen. I suspect you all have a longer timeline. And we don't know how long egg, sperm, ovarian tissue will sit and how many things can change over that time frame. Shipping genetic material introduces risks, and those arrows are supposed to remind me to say in both directions. You ship out to long-term facilities or to another program. They ship back for your patients to use them. We suddenly have more legal vulnerability of these things in transit. Tanks are not infinitely expandable, and accidents happen. People can disappear and not leave you their credit cards, so you can't bill them anymore. People's lives and health changes. They leave the state. They go somewhere else, which changes the legal paradigm we use for jurisdiction. Relationships change. People divorce, die. 
All of that is happening while this stuff is sitting in your tanks or in somebody else's. And in the meantime, you're getting better at everything you do. So we have medical advances, genetic advances, and sometimes the law even advances. So all of those, I think, make it really a complicated scene in which to figure out how to practice. I often say that you all make babies and all that the law can do is make language and make things as precise as we can. And so I often say language really matters in my field. This little guy was so close. He was told to bring to Philosophy 101 his Plato book. He thought he heard Play-Doh. It's really, really close, but it's not going to get him a good grade in class, right? It's not close enough. Another thing that I like to point out when I talk about language is has any, well, let me just do it this way instead. What do you see on the screen on the left-hand side? Anybody? A guitar. What do you see on the right-hand side? What's the difference? Huh? One you plug in, exactly. One's an electric guitar and one's an acoustic guitar. You just learned the name word retronym. Okay, so this is now the password on my site for my law, class, my law students. A retronym is defined in the dictionary as a word or phrase that was created because an existing term that used to be okay just to use alone, guitar, now has to be distinguished from a newer term. We never called it an acoustic guitar an acoustic guitar until we had electric ones, an analog watch, a digital watch, a black and white TV, a brick and mortar store, a mother, an intended mother, a genetic mother, a, bio a biological mother, an egg donor, lesbian couples, that's not an egg donor, but we gotta be careful. An embryo, any of you who are old enough to have Stedman's Medical Dictionary from the 1970s, look it up, an embryo is a conceptus. It has no differentiation from a fetus. Why? Because there was no such thing. Transfer, we're gonna to get to, it's a really fun case. So what I would say to you is, in the world of art, language really matters. Using these terms indiscriminately is a recipe for a bad legal outcome. Embryo, donor, patient, fertilization versus conception. I'm gonna tell you that I don't think there's many abandoned embryos as people think there are in this country because I don't think they're really abandoned transfer. And my two most hated words of the month are embryo adoption. It does not exist except in a couple of states. I appreciate my mental health professionals, all of the differences of raising a child who is not genetically related to you, but adoption is a time-honored legal structure in which biological parents relinquish their legal rights to adoptive parents after birth. I have had so many clients who say to me, I want to do embryo adoption. I go, that's awesome. I'm in Massachusetts. You have four days after birth for, to relinquish your child for any or no reason. Would you like to take that embryo that you want to adopt, have it put in your body, nine months later delivered, and then four days later go back to the, back to the biological parents and say, are you sure? Everybody, God, of course not. So, okay, so let's talk about embryo donation, not embryo adoption, because we are grafting on language that doesn't fit. And if I hear three parent IVF in this room, I'll probably run to the airport faster than but you want me to. Because once again, what does it mean that mitochondrial donation can't be just called donor mitochondria, like donor egg, donor sperm? In egg donation, we don't talk about three parent IVF, and there we have an egg donor who is full genetic mother, if you will, but she's considered a donor. So a three parent IVF is a legal nightmare. It doesn't exist, and I wish they would get it out of the front page of every newspaper that does an article on mitochondrial replacement. Okay, off my soapbox for a minute. I would suggest to you that the most accurate terminology for an embryo is a pre-implantation IVF embryo. I also think that all the problems we're having with embryos are creating a great rationale for freezing eggs and sperm. I'll tell you a funny story. I had one of my students about five years ago say to me, I don't understand all this stuff about embryos. You keep arguing, telling us all about these cases. Why doesn't everyone just go freeze their sperm and freeze their eggs separately? It's like, oh, sweetheart, that's so cute. You tell a happily married couple, hi, you might divorce, you know, I know you're really happy today, but we don't know what's gonna happen, so maybe you should freeze your sperm and eggs separately. I think she's absolutely right. I think five years from now, it's probably gonna be standard of care to be saying to people, why don't you freeze your eggs and sperm separately? It will avoid embryo disputes. So what is a pre-implantation IVF embryo? It depends on who you ask and why you ask. Context always matters, jurisdiction always matters, and I'm gonna to try to prove that to you. The very first frozen embryo case in this country, 1992, Davis versus Davis, stands for a very important principle still used and relied on today. Husband and wife broke up, divorced. What happened, the IVF program had just moved, had not yet unpacked the consent form, so there was nothing in writing about disposition. Husband wants to discard them, wife wants to use them. The court 
concludes that pre-embryos, and I know there are a lot of embryologists who think that is a stupid word. I'll just tell you from a legal perspective, distinguishing an IVF pre-implantation embryo by some terminology is a wonderful gift to the legal system. We conclude that pre-embryos are not strictly speaking either persons or property, but an occupy an interim category entitling them to special respect because of their potential for human life. That is a beautiful statement. It came out of the very first ethics committee for ASRM. Why do I think it's beautiful? Because it says very clearly, they're not persons, they're not property. Because of the potential they have, we have to treat them with some additional respect. The husband in this case won. His constitutional right not to procreate trumped his wife's when there was no draft, there was nothing drafted to preclude that. So even if we give them special respect for their potential for life, it does not mean we can't discard them. I wish the people drafting the personhood bills would think about that. Very, very quickly, I want to tell you about a couple of cases that are outside the United States, but which I think are really critical. Fertilization, conception, it makes a big difference. Mario, I don't know how many of you have heard of this case, but in Costa Rica, it was the only country in the world that banned IVF. A 12-year lawsuit ultimately ended up saying, you cannot do this. What they had said was an embryo is sacrosanct and IVF harms embryos, ergo no IVF. And the court said no. And the court said conception occurs with implantation, not fertilization. And I think that is a wonderfully important principle. It's consistent with Roe v. Wade. They went on to say, and we don't have to go through all the quotes, but I put the middle one in because it says, the dispute as to when human life begins is a question that has been assessed from biological, medical, ethical, moral, philosophical, and religious perspective. This court, there is no one agreed definition of the beginning of life, but conception cannot be understood as a moment or process exclusive of a woman's body, given that an embryo has no chance of survival if implantation does not occur. So that's my answer to Alyssa saying when life begins, I'm not supposed to know because even the Inter-American Court of Human Rights couldn't give you an answer. The surrogacy case in the middle here, I just want to give you because, again, it just shows you how important language is in my field. In Australian Queensland, you cannot do surrogacy unless you enter into an agreement before <laughs> conception. What happened, a woman had embryos and then found out she couldn't carry. Her sister said, I'll to carry for you. The question was, is this legal or is it not legal? Because they didn't sign an agreement until after the embryos were created and they were still in the freezer. And you know what? The court went to the Oxford English Dictionary and something called the Macquarie Dictionary and said, conceive is to become pregnant. And this is what it means. And therefore, when they signed an agreement while the embryo was in the freezer, it doesn't break the law because conception has to meet a woman's body. Anything else would have meant that a sister couldn't carry for her sister, which is kind of a crazy outcome. And then, of course, there's Rick Paulson's recent um, editorial, Inklings in Fertility and Sterility, where he talks about, let's not say human life begins at fertilization. I wish he'd said conception. But he talks about it being a continuum and about how science does not follow the same rules as religion. We have to be more nuanced. So let's take about three weeks of my class and distill it down to about three minutes. There have been, over the last 20 plus years, a slew of divorcing embryo cases, I call them. The bottom line is the following. Courts always want to hear from you guys. They want to understand the science. If you read those cases really carefully, which you probably won't, but I have a number of times, they use pre-embryo, they use zygote, they use pre-dash embryo. They want to distinguish an ex utero pre-implantation IVF embryo from a pregnant woman. Their theory, they go to the medical dictionaries, they go to legal treatises, they go to medical treat. I mean, it's fascinating. They have a great time trying to figure out the science. So what I would say to you is if you're ever asked to testify in one of these cases, you'll be helping the legal system understand what you do. I'm not going to try to explain to you the various facts, theories, and outcomes in these cases. They are all over the lot. They come out with a contract analysis, a change of mind, a contemporaneous. Here's the only bottom line we know, that no appellate court has ever allowed one spouse to use embryos for procreation over the objection of the former spouse. We don't know if that's going to hold true. And what I want to take a look at with you is some of the things that may be cracking that a little bit. So I call these last chance divorcing embryos, but it kind of makes me laugh because I keep thinking, who would go to court if it wasn't your last chance embryo, right? If you could go create new embryos with somebody you liked a lot better than your former spouse, I doubt you would take the time and money to go to court and fight with the jerk, right? <laughs> However, in the trial court level, these judges can be really sympathetic because these facts can be really egregious. In every one of these cases, the wife won. The one I'll just point out to you, which just makes me laugh because it was so sad, 
and lawyers just are cynical people. Reber versus Reese, this guy is cheating on his wife while she's going through chemotherapy. He's cheating on her with a fertile woman who then he walks out, divorces her, marries his second wife, and has a baby, and then says, nope, you cannot use those embryos even though you can't have kids anymore. And the court was like, we're having none of that. I don't know how, you know, I mean, sometimes I think courts know exactly how they want to come out. They just don't know how to dress it up. Like, you are a jerk. You do not get to stop her from having a baby. The difference that I want to point out to you is I think trial courts are sympathetic and appellate courts are more interested in the law. I also, how many of you are familiar with the Finley versus Lee case, which is the University of California, uh, UCSF, Mitch Rosen's case in 2015? Okay, I want to give you a different perspective for a minute, and I don't want to suggest to you that you're going to be in court on Tuesdays and Thursdays. You have other things to do. You have to make babies and families. But this is what happened in Finley versus Lee, which I think is fascinating, and I think is sort of one of those bird, you know, bird in the canary, you know, canary in the mine kind of thing. Um, IVF, 10 days after the wife's diagnosed with ovarian cancer, five embryos produced. The couple signs two clinic forms. Look at the difference. The first one is an informed consent for treatment. The second is a consent and agreement for cryopreservation disposition of frozen embryos. And the couple chooses discard. So what happens, the wife says, I want those. I didn't realize that was a contract. It was a contract, I never read it. It was just like my Apple iPhone. I never read the fine print on my Apple iPhone. The husband's like, I want to discard them, and that's what we agreed to. The question was, was document number two a contract, enforceable under California law, and not an informed consent? Because you can withdraw an informed consent. We don't know for how long in the world of frozen embryos, but we know that's the principle. But the principle of a contract is, if it's really a good one, you're bound by it. And so the, the wife argued it wasn't, and the husband argued it was. And then to their credit, UCSF said, you know what, we allow you to, we're going to be joined in this case as an indispensable party because if you don't uphold document number two as a contract, chaos is going to break out in our clinics. We cannot maintain an IVF practice if we can't rely on the fact that when our patients sign our forms, we know what's going to happen with them. So he testified for six hours. The first question the wife's attorney asked him is, how many embryos have you killed? It sort of went downhill from there. Mitch was pretty sure that he was going to be like, you know, never going to get this case out of the woods. But it, the court ended up saying, under California law, it's an enforceable contract. The wife is not deprived of parenthood, just the use of these embryos to achieve parenthood. Now, she probably was no longer fertile. It did not happen, help that she was a doctor who had worked in an IVF clinic when she said she didn't understand the forms. I can tell you, the court was not that impressed. But here was a case, I think, in which separating those forms, labeling them, and making them consistent with state law was really helpful. This is the direction the new model consents are going to go. So I want you to keep that in mind. We talk about a couple of other cases. And as I said, in most of these cases, it wouldn't be, they wouldn't be in court if they weren't last chance embryos. On the other hand, there are a couple of them that are teaching tools that are not last chance embryos. For those of you who don't read People Magazine on a regular basis, We've got Sophia Vergara here, where she was happily in a relationship with Nick Loeb forever until they split up, and then she married Mighty Mike. So what happened was when Sophia and Nick were together, they had IVF and they had embryos created at a clinic in California. What happens? Nick Loeb decides, with a little help from his friends, that he wants those embryos. I don't know how many of you saw this editorial that he penned for the New York Times. I think he got a little help from the Thomas More Society. Have any of you, do you, any of you familiar with the Thomas More Society? Okay, so they are an anti-abortion right to life group. They come in and they are writing amicus briefs and supporting litigation on behalf of people who do not want their embryos destroyed. So they came in to support Nick Loeb. They claim that these are his daughters. There are two female embryos left. And he wrote this very, very touching editorial in which he said, embryonic custody, when we create embryos for the purpose of life, shouldn't we define them as life rather than property? That's a false paradigm, folks. Remember the AFS statement, ASRMs, neither property nor persons, but entitled to special respect? So they create a false paradigm and then say we're going for life. Um, Loeb is Jewish, but he said he was very influenced by his Catholic nanny growing up. Interestingly, the case was going on in California for a very long time until Sophia Vergara and her lawyers found out that Nick Loeb had two former girlfriends who'd had abortions. So they went and they moved to discover the names of these women because they wanted to bring them in and talk about his respect for life et cetera, et cetera, and he said, not over my dead body, and dismissed the case. End of discussion. Except there were some very creative lawyers in Louisiana, and they decided they would bring a lawsuit on behalf of Emma and Isabella, who they were the two female embryos they named. 
and they became trustees. They created a trust, and they said that Emma and Isabella needed to be born in order to have the benefit of the trust. Now, for those of you who haven't looked at Louisiana law lately, it's the only law in the entire United States that defines an IVF embryo as a juridical person. So they actually have a little slender leg to stand on, if you will. They try everything they can think of. They have said, let's treat, since Sophia Vergara doesn't want the embryos, let's consider her an egg donor, get her out of the picture. They're trying to make the California clinic ship them to Louisiana. Good luck with that. Vergara has had the case removed to federal court. She's seeking to dismiss it. We have to wait and see what happens, but it's a pretty slender read to be trying to push, but it really does show you the length that these cases will go to. So I want to point out quickly three other cases, um, be just because two things. One is just to show you that in the last 12 months, we've already got three more of these pending. Then I just want to talk about McQueen and Rucker briefly. Uh, Rooks is just another balancing test and the husband wins, so we're seeing consistency. But McQueen is a Missouri case that's really interesting. Why? Same facts as always, a couple of embryos, husband wants them discarded, wife wants to use them. She's an attorney. She is supported by the Thomas More Center. Very media savvy, has a press conference on the courthouse steps where the Dred Scott slavery decision was argued. The court rules against her, says you're not infertile, this is not your last chance, and it would violate the husband's constitutional rights. Unclear how many, how much weight was given to each factor. The wife appeals, and do we see the Thomas More Society's strategy again? This is Noah and Genesis because they are male embryos, and they're unborn children, according to her appeal, not marital property. The court should have appointed a guardian ad litem to figure out what's in the best interest of these frozen embryos. And she has something that wasn't in most of the cases, a statute in Missouri that says the life of each human being begins at conception, and unborn children are entitled to all the rights, privileges, and immunities available to other persons. So there was a real question and a real worry in Missouri as to whether or not she would win because of that statute. And I think there was a sigh of relief in the ART community because the court came out in favor of the husband. And he said, under Missouri law, these are unique, distinct marital property. So this is where you start seeing state law matters. They are marital property. In Missouri, that means joint control. No one can use them, release them, or transfer them without permission of the other ex-spouse. They also said there was no contract. Why? Because under Missouri law, it wasn't notarized. A few questions about the wife had a couple of notations, like I want the wife to have them that was in a different color ink than the signature on the form, which got the court a little confused about whether that was done simultaneously. And they said the husband had rescinded. Finally, the court said something really important, which is it would violate the husband's constitutional right not to parent. Pre-implantation zygotes or fertilized eggs from IVF are not unborn children. That's the kind of thing I wish we would see more of, because that's a very clear pronouncement by a court. Rejected the wife's appeal. She is supporting the next personhood bill that has been filed in Missouri that's pending as we speak. And again, this slide is just to prove to Alyssa that I can't give the answer to when life begins because just like the Murillo court, this court recognizes the sensitive nature, the differing personal beliefs, ethical, religious, philosophical, and we don't have to decide this. We're only called upon to decide whether red highlight frozen pre-embryos have the legal status of children under our marriage statutes? No. So, as I was getting ready to come here, I realized there's another new case, which is just amazing to me that these keep coming. This one is, was argued April 17th in the Supreme Court of Georgia, so we don't know what's going to happen. But what I find really interesting in this case is that the court, two things. The embryos were made with donor egg out at, or in Oregon. I'm not sure why the couple went to Oregon. They have twins. They have three frozen embryos left. As usual, the husband wants them destroyed, the wife wants them to use them. And the consent form, and I don't understand why in 2013 anyone's consent form would say this, it says that upon the dissolution of the marriage, the court will determine. It's much safer to say, uh, have a default provision. We, the couple, tell you what to do. So the lower court ruled for the husband, and he cited that Davis case I showed you from 1992. And he said, the preference of the progenitors in an agreement should govern. And then they cited a case out of Washington State's Litowitz in which it was donor egg embryos and said, in that case, there had been a contract treating the couple equally, and they were going to follow the contract. In this case, they said, only one progenitor, no form, no contract, progenitor wins. So this is another one of those questions in my mind. How are we going to start seeing further lit litigation develop around embryos created with donor sperm or donor egg? To date, we've all treated them the same. 
We've hopefully got good forms that say that. But as more and more couples use donor sperm and donor egg, including all our same-sex couples, I think this is going to be an issue that we're going to see more of. So that case, husband wins. It's on appeal, however. And the wrinkle, and you don't have to look at the specifics, but if you're interested, the reason I put this slide in at the last minute is because Georgia has something called the option of adoption statute that says a legal embryo custodian may relinquish all their legal rights to a recipient prior to the embryo transfer, and that contract will transfer legal rights. So it goes back to my, this is an embryo adoption. This is embryo donation. This is saying you can sever rights and affix them to a recipient. I'm really curious whether the wife is going to try, because she's already raised this statute, to say he must allow me to have them under this statute. It's not going to be just a matter of voluntariness. So that's sort of a stay tuned, and we'll see what happens in that case. I promise you I'd throw one case in that doesn't have to do with custody, but I just think this definitely has to do with retronyms and language. The Rucker case was decided in December. Mayo Clinic's consent form, unfortunately, had a box that said, quote, continue to store for transfer to the female partner. And the question was, did that mean transfer to her body or transfer to her for use, as lawyers use that term, assignment or conveyance? And the lower court said, oh, it means she just gets them to do with whatever she wants. And the husband's like, no, no, no. That just meant to put in her body if we both agreed. And then the appellate court stopped and said, reverse. There are many ways the transfer can be used. It can be physical. And then he finally went, they're using it in the transfer for procreation to produce a pregnancy, all with hyphens in between, meaning. And that's the meaning of transfer. However, they also talk about transfer for custody. They also talk about transferring the embryos to a, long, a long-term storage facility. So I bring, bring it up with people to sort of show how hard it is and how important it is to have precise language in this field. Ultimately, the court has sent it back to the lower court, said we think it meant physical transfer to the uterus for procreation. One reason they said, there was no similar checkoff box for the husband that said continue to store for transfer to the male partner. So therefore, it had to be in the, quote, produce a pregnancy meaning. You shouldn't have to guess at this. You shouldn't have to go to court or go off on appeal and spend tens of thousands of dollars to resolve these questions. So what's a clinic to do? I always feel like as a lawyer, it's my obligation not to just tell you the problems, but to tell you maybe some of the solutions. I can tell you that my colleagues are debating this all the time. They want to know how many agreements there should be. Should they be witnessed, notarized? Should the husband have a lawyer? Should the wife have a lawyer? Should all the donors have lawyers? Everybody, before they sign anything in your office, my bottom line is the patients aren't going to stop coming while we figure this out. On a practical level, what I suggest is there should be two forms like in Finley. I think it's a really good idea, a consent to, pro a consent to the procedure and a disposition. If the problems that I think we're going to start seeing, aside from I already mentioned the donor gamete embryos, are when, kid, when you know, one of my friends said, this is that, you know, things appear larger than they do in your rearview mirror. Well, five years from now, it may, you may feel a lot differently if you've had a couple of kids and now you don't want your ex-wife to have a couple more that you don't want to come and pick up on Saturday afternoon. So people really do need to think about these more, the patients, and get more counseling. One of my friends said, they have to see a lawyer. And then I was talking to a mental health professional and said, excuse me, but I really think that's the role of the mental health profession, to help counsel patients about these issues, not the lawyers. And I think she's got a point. So I think, you know, and when I think about lesbian couples, for example, and there's only going to be one progenitor, but it's very likely that the partner's brother may have been the sperm donor because they wanted a biological link. And is there really no claim by that lesbian spouse who is not genetically related to the embryo, but is biologically related through her brother? So I think we're going to see cases around this. I hope we're going to see more counseling. And as I said, I think there, you always have to comply with applicable local law as well. That's why I sort of highlighted the California, Georgia, and Missouri differences. What's around the corner, I think, are two things, short-term storage of embryos and freezing gametes. So let's talk about those for a couple minutes. Um, I often talk about traveling embryos, like what's in those tanks, and I personally don't think they're kids. I don't think the law thinks of them that way. I do think that traveling embryos are going to create, are already creating and going to continue to create new problems. We're seeing a lot of movement in embryos. You know it better than I do. Interstate, international, short-term programs, shipping them off for long-term storage. I've had a couple embryologists say to me, you know, when I went to school and trained, I never thought I'd be running a shipping service, but that's how I feel now. Down in New Orleans, about 10 years ago, there was litigation at the Oxner Clinic, and the embryos were not frozen properly, and the question the court had to decide, was it medical malpractice, or was this just a simple tort? Is storing embryos medical practice? That court said no. 
I don't know what every court would say. They also, in fairly insulting language, said storing and labeling embryos is something a high schooler could do with proper training. Most of us don't agree with that. The kind of claims we're going to see have run the gamut. There's been a wrongful death claim brought for embryos that were damaged and destroyed. That got shot down by the court. Embryos are not people. Ergo, we can't kill them. However, is it a breach of contract? Probably. Is it a tort, meaning something you did wrong, negligence, malpractice, one or the other? Probably. Amount of damages, I think, is going to depend on whether they're those last chance embryos of an oncofertility patient or whether those were donor eggs being shipped and you can just buy another batch. The chain of custody concerns, I think, are bigger and bigger. That's where you know everything travels through, and it's whose fault is it? I've been a longtime advocate of saying, let's track tanks better than we've been able to. I actually think putting a video camera on top of your embryology uh, table when you're opening the tanks and running a, a video to show that you received those embryos and what shape they were in is not a bad idea. And my last one, which is not funny, is, but it seems like it is, you may not want to ship during ASRM. I've had three cases where embryos were improperly stored, shipped, and completely dis destroyed during ASRM because the senior embryologists were at the meeting. What are the advantages and disadvantages? I think they can reduce vulnerability for clinics, but you're still going to be shipping those embryos someplace. I think you're going to always need your documents. And I think there's this Goldilocks question. How long is the right amount of time before you ship? There was a program in Florida that shipped out in six months. I think that is too short. Your patient has barely had time to get pregnant, much less find out whether she's going to have a baby. And you have put those embryos in transit and risked them going from point A to point B and back again to point A. And in a case pending in Florida, what happened? A UPS driver, with the best of intentions, saw something coming out of the tank, assumed it was a hazmat problem. And we all know what you do when you see hazmat, right? There's a protocol, and you call somebody, and you put on all the white suits. He just clipped the little thing and opened it up to make sure it wasn't a problem. And in the process, destroyed the only embryos this couple had. They are suing UPS. They're suing their IVF clinic. They're suing the long-term storage facility. There's a question about li limits of liability for UPS. Um, lots, of, lots of interesting federal questions, state questions. None of it is going to bring these embryos back for this couple. Um, so let's talk about abandoned embryos really briefly. I am a believer, and I may be in the minority, that there are fewer of them than we like to, than people say there are in the media. And the reason is that I think more of these embryos have dispositional instructions than we realize. ASRM guidelines say if you don't have SOPs, Five years of no contact and written notice, you can consider them abandoned. I would put a big caveat, subject to state law and abandoned property. And the new model consents, however, do something I think a lot better. The old ones did it almost as well, which is we patients say that if we disappear, stop paying, you can't find us, blah, 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 we have authorized you in this form to discard our embryos. Those are not abandoned. So when I work with programs, what I say to them is let's go back and look at every consent form or dispositional document you have as it applies to whatever batch of embryos you can't find the patients for. And let's read them line for line and see whether or not they are abandoned because you don't have instructions the way they did at the Mayo Clinic or whether you actually have discard instructions. And if you have discard instructions, I don't think you have an abandoned embryo. So then your question is going to be, what do you do? Okay, so first, are they really abandoned? Check all your documents. Check all your protocols. Don't unintentionally trigger an abandonment standard. That means you send a letter that about five, six years ago when abandonment first became a big term that everybody used, somebody said, I know, let's start writing letters that say, if we don't hear from you, we will consider your embryos abandoned. It was a really well-intended thing, but it was a really terrible idea because you just triggered five years starting from that day. And you disregarded everything that you might have had your patients sign before you told them that they had abandoned the embryos when they thought they might have directed them. Here's the hardest piece of advice, and I want to be totally honest. I have given it to multiple programs as their attorney, and most of them have said, Susan, thank you for your advice. My favorite response was from my, which is basically do what you say, say what you do, and do what you say. So if you say, if we do not hear from you in X number of years and you have not come forward, you have authorized us to discard your embryos, think about discarding those embryos. Maybe you want to send a letter saying, pursuant to your directions in 1983, we will be discarding your embryos six months from this date unless we hear from you otherwise. Don't say, you know, more than that. My favorite response from my client who wouldn't listen to me was, I am retiring in two years. I'm going to buy one more tank and let the next guy deal with it. I understand that, but I'm going to give you an example of why I think you should consider doing it differently. 
And that's a case, hypothetically, in which several years later, a wife comes back and says, is there any chance you still have our embryos? I really want them now. I'm separated, but I want them. And the clinic said, good, good news. Yeah, we got them. They call me up. There's a form that says discard them. I'm like, the ex-husband is going to go bananas on you if you do this. You can't do this. So what does the ex-wife do? She goes to court ex-party, doesn't tell her husband, tries to tell her husband, but he's moved out of state, so she knows he's not going to answer, goes into court to a judge who's really sympathetic, trial judges are really sympathetic, explains the whole thing in some way that persuades this judge on the spot to give her a court order that says, you clinic, give him the embryos, give her the embryos. And she brings us the court order and says, see, now how many times have you guys said, if we have a court order, we'll do something? They call me up and they say, Susan, look, we got a court order, we're in good shape, right? I'm like, no, this guy never got noticed, he's out of state. This court order has not got the weight of a, a real court behind it. I think you're totally vulnerable if he comes up. Wife's attorney is screaming and yelling, going, there's a much bigger chance you're going to get a lawsuit from us than from him. And I said, you're probably right. You still can't do it. At the end of the day, and I don't want to guess how she did it, she got her husband to agree. I don't want to know what happened in there, but those embryos weren't coming out of that tank without his permission. And if he had said no and somebody had released them to her, I think that clinic would have had a tremendous amount of legal vulnerability to that guy because they had promised to do something and they didn't do it. So give me a court order isn't always the best answer. Holding on to embryos where you have directions I think has its own risk. I understand practically speaking it's really hard to make the decision. So does anybody have a, a predictions in a crystal ball? Probably not. Here's my sort of summation on this topic which is I think you should have a protocol with legal advice. Make sure it's consistent with your state law. Language matters. I think ESET's going to increase embryo freezing to some degree. I've already mentioned I think our same-sex couples are going to be pushing this envelope. Egg freezing is going to have a big impact. It's going to replace embryo freezing to a large degree, and all these disputes I talk about will become historical, maybe. I think it's also going to impact the anti-abortion personhood battles, but I don't think they're going away. And In this administration, I think we're seeing more and more of them. This is just a quick slide to give you an idea of how many are currently pending. Missouri, Texas, Indiana, Iowa was just defeated, and there are two federal bills. People don't think they're going to go anywhere, but one of them says that the right to life is fundamental to Americans and human rights must be given to zygotes, embryos, and fetuses. So I was at the Women's March in January, and I loved this poster, Thou Shalt Not Mess with the Women's Reproductive Rights, Fallopians 1.2. <laughs> One. And I keep thinking about what does it mean, the reproductive rights in this world, of ART, IVF, and personhood battles. And then I was reading the newspaper, and I'm sure all of you saw the artificial wombs. And if you didn't, this is a lamb who's been put in a Ziploc baggie, essentially, um, an, external placenta, uh, an external uterus, and grown for four weeks from here to here. And this is research going on in Philadelphia. It's being touted as the possible answer for preemies. I'm really scared it's the idea that embryos, you don't want them as a so-and-so, no problem. But that embryo under laws in Louisiana, under the husband wanting them, it doesn't involve your reproductive rights. We're just going to be able to do this. Don't worry about it. So is freezing eggs the answer? I think we have a lot of unknown questions, but nothing is stopping us, right? Oh, crap, was that today? I mean, we're doing egg freezing, right? Everybody's doing it, and it's just transforming whether we want to or not, how you guys practice and how the law reacts. I think I've already said this, it shifts, it is shifting into a safer practice, but it is also bringing its own problems, and I just want to really fast, quickly give you a couple of my thoughts about this. Um, clearly, there are two target populations. There's fertility preservation for your own use. Some of that is the oncofertility, and some of that is for speculative future use. I think social freezing is a terrible term. The risks, I think, for the medical community on the imminent medical need is overlooking making sure people know it's an option. I think there's going to be vulnerability in the cancer community. We talked about this before dinner. For doctors who don't tell their patients, you might want to go talk to a fertility specialist before we do this treatment. For future speculative need, I think the, 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 the issue is overpromising. This is going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. You can, come, you can freeze your eggs, and they will be there whenever you want honey. And then, of course, there are all the donor issues we're not going to talk about tonight, although I just want to point out that I think there may be an overlap, because if Google and Facebook are freezing all their young women's eggs so that they can keep working, eventually some of those women aren't going to need those eggs, right? And there are entrepreneurs. There are brightest young women that we have in the field, right? Why aren't they going to open up their own egg banks, the Google egg bank and the Facebook egg bank, and cut out all the middle guys? So I think we're going to have to keep an eye on this. It's going to be really interesting. Um, 
Okay, so I have to always tell you like how good my advice is and how badly it's followed. I tell my law students, I give them a whole class on egg freezing. I say, don't be, you know, it's overpromised, it's overhyped. You may never need them. You may meet Mr. Wright, Ms. Wright ahead of time. You may never need them. And so I talk to them and I talk to them and I talk to them. And I think I'm really good. And one of them raises her hand and says, yes, question. And she goes, Facebook and Google are doing this. I'm taking the bar exam in July. I heard the hormones might make me a little crazy, so I don't want the cycle then. But as soon as I take the bar exam, I have six weeks before I start, I'm going to my law firm and telling them I want a free cycle. If Facebook and Google get it, I get it. I want one and I want it in August. It's like, okay, I really did a bad job here, didn't I? It's not very persuasive. What I do warn people is that today's law students are also going to be tomorrow's lawyers, so if we do overpromise this technology, they may have all the resources they need to come back and tell us what we did wrong. There are a couple of other issues with egg donation. I run a flag really quickly because Michael told me I had to leave room for answers, not questions. Um, sometimes people say, what's the difference in egg and sperm freezing? And what I say, first of all, is that an egg donor is a patient. And they have to be given all the protections of your patients. Sperm donors are not patients. I also am really worried about this duty to warn. I'm sure any of you who have been through medical school know that when it comes to genetics, there are legal principles that say you have to warn your patient. You have a genetic predisposition disability. This could be inheritable. There are cases out there that say if you have a patient with a genetically linked disease, you have a duty to warn their family. And the question is, how do you warn their family? Usually you say to the patient, go tell your daughters and sons that you have X, Y, Z. If they don't tell, there are some cases that say you may have a duty to go tell the daughters and sons. I don't know how we do that in the world of egg freezing, where eggs and gametes are going all around the country and the world. And the other thing I don't know is once you have had an egg donor as a patient and you freeze her eggs and you send them to a bank, are you still her doctor? Do you still have a doctor-patient relationship? Or is she now just somebody who has sold her eggs to a bank and there is now a business relationship between her and those legal standards apply? I don't think we know the answers, but I think they're interesting and hard questions. So this is a little bit of a busy slide which talks about the same thing, the duty to warn. Um, Skipping down through the tier because I want to leave more time for questions. I would say the donor updates are worrying me because I don't know how we update this genetic information. Obviously, from a business point of view, better to put the um, onus on the donor than on the banks and the programs. But I think this is just going to be one of those things we're going to have to see over time. One of my students wrote a wonderful paper called Can a Donor Pull Out? Whether or not a donor can change their mind after they've had their genetic material put into a bank. The answer in New York is yes. The regulations say that anybody who freezes genetic tissue as a donor can pull out until an intended parent has started a cycle in reliance. I'm not sure when that is. It might be when they order those eggs to come. Um, so I think this is a new world. I don't think we know the answer. I think the stork has gotten to be a pretty heavy lifting job here. Um, I will say that I think helping the stork is an ongoing challenge for all of us, not just the medical community, but I hope the legal community and partnership. I was asked to give a, you know, I, as I said, I don't like to be accused of only doing doom, gloom and doom, so I want to leave you with a few predictions. I think we're going to have more cryopreservation, gametes than embryos. I think the banking industry is, a banking, gamete banking is going to create all sorts of fascinating questions, and I think shipping has made this more complicated. I don't know how many of you use anything besides UPS and FedEx, but they both have limitations of liability. I've spoken to groups of embryologists, and we all have acknowledged that they are not adequately insured, but we can't find a better alternative right now. I do think they're less abandonment, but we're going to have other tough questions about what you do with those things in your tanks. Um, I think the standards are unclear. If UPS can say that we only have limited liability, that I don't know who you go to for liability except the person who started that shipping. I think we're going to have more scrutiny of labs, embryologists, programs, and banks, but we also don't know what those theories are going to be. There's certainly going to be more legal defenses under chain of custody. It was him, her, them, me, not me. Go find somebody else to blame. Um, last couple of things I want to say, a couple of take-home messages. I want to go back to where I started, which is to say I do think language in this field is absolutely critical, and I hope that you all will be part of the solution in terms of using very precise language. I think special respect for pre-implantation IVF embryos, neither property nor persons, if your state law allows it, is the way to go. Documentation that is consistent with your state law is always best. It's going to help, I think, to separate these forms. I think it's even going to help with the unsettled issues, but I think more counseling would be helpful. I would be really careful about not inviting an abandonment issue. 
And I think you're going to have to be nimble and thoughtfully address all of these issues because it's really almost impossible to predict where the next litigation legal battlefield is going to be except for this personhood thing, which I think we can all anticipate. So my last point is that we're all in this together. Please don't shoot all the lawyers. We're trying to be co collaborative, not litigious. And with that, I'll just close and say thank you. I'm happy to take answers.